Hockey is, of course, an institution in this country, and for six plus decades, another national institution, the CBC, brought it into living rooms from coast to coast to coast. Then, suddenly, in 2013, the NHL signed a blockbuster deal worth more than $5 billion that transferred the broadcast rights to Rogers. David Schultz is a veteran sports writer for the Globe and Mail, and his new book, Hockey Fight in Canada, the big media face-off over the NHL, diagrams the maneuverings that led to that shake-up, and he joins us now for more. David, good to have you back here. Thank you, Steve. It's, it's only, good to be here. It's only been more than a what, decade. 30 I think. years, I think. <laughs> no, it hasn't been 30 years, <laughs> but it's been a while. Um, it's not, I mean, there's a ton of new hockey books that come out every year, obviously, but this one, unlike, I think, many of those, spends almost all of its time in the boardrooms as opposed to on the ice. Why was this a story you thought needed to be told? Well, you know, I, I, when I started out covering this for the Globe and Mail, I, I wasn't sure that it was. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, of course, when newspapers all have their own websites, we can instantly read or see who's reading what and how much. And these stories took off with the readers right from the start. And, after, and, and they would lead anything in the paper, really, for readership. And after a while, it, it occurred to me, well, of course. I mean, Hockey Night Canada has been part of uh, Canadian households for you know, well over 60 years, so why wouldn't they be invested well, in it? Well, people care who brings them the games? Oh, yeah, very much so. And uh, I think, well, Rogers found that out later when they started messing around mm. with the host and uh, Well, we'll get Ron to that. And we'll get that. to that. Yeah, so. Is there, I mean, we've got a bunch of players in this story. Obviously, there's the CBC who had the rights mm. for a long time. Rogers and Bell are trying to make a pitch to, to get in there with huge offers. Is there a good guy and a, and a, and a bad guy in this story? Um, well, some people might tell you it's all bad guys, but uh, good guys, oh, I don't know. We're talking huge amounts of money, so there's, mm -hmm. I, I don't see anyone in a sort of white knight role. Um, bad guys, it's, it's the same thing. There were some people who weren't as good at their jobs as others, and ultimately those people turned out to work for the CBC. I think that's as close as you can get to defining those kind of roles. Gotcha. Uh, Okay, CBC had had the broadcast rights for six plus decades, and then Rogers comes in with this $5.2 billion offer to last more than a decade, and they essentially buy the whole kit and caboodle. When you heard this for the first time, when you were covering this mm -hmm. at the time, yeah. what'd you think? Well, it is a shocking number uh, when you consider it's Canadian television. Those kind of numbers really, you know, $5 billion hadn't really been tossed around before. But at the same time, People in the industry knew it was coming because um, the industry was getting to be in a bit of a crisis in that the, the cord cutters were putting pressure on profits through, uh, you know, declining viewership and declining advertising. And uh, but at the same time, oddly enough, rights fees kept rising mm. because of the weird fact that live sports was sort of impervious to that kind of eroding of viewership. You can't really PVR a sports you game. Can't, yeah, you, yeah, you can PVR, but then you got to run around for the rest of the day and not let anybody tell you the <laughs> score, you know. So yeah. um, that that sort of thing. So it became sort of as television programming struggled for viewers, this became impervious to it. So you knew the numbers were going to be big. Mm. And uh, and that's what exactly it turned out to be. Absolutely. Let's go back to 2012. There's a routine, I guess, meeting at the NHL All-Star Game between the CBC and the NHL Board of Governors. Yeah. What, what happened at that meeting that was a little atypical? Well, that, um, that meeting is always just sort of a little back-slapping, you know, annual do at the at the party weekend of the All-Star Game, and nothing much ever happens, only this time, uh, the governors of the NHL teams were getting really unhappy with the C CBC for a couple of reasons. One was that they thought the focus of the broadcast was all wrong. They, they wanted the focus on the players, and there was too much panel shows and that sort of thing. That was a constant with them. But the other thing that was really upsetting them was that they thought Ron McLean and Don Cherry were far too critical of the CBC. And it was at such a a pitch that Brian Burke phoned Jeffrey Orridge, who at that time was head of CBC Let, let's Sports. Just, we got a lot of non-sports people watching here. So yeah. Brian Burke, who was at, he, the time, at that time, he was the general manager and president of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Okay. And he Jeffrey phoned Orridge, Orridge and said who hey, was, he was the head of CBC Sports. Okay. So Jeffrey Orridge and um, uh, 
Kirsten Stewart, I believe, who was head of English TV. They were the two that were going to go to this meeting, which she expected just to be, here's the wonderful things we're doing for you. And everybody shakes hands and says, okay, let's go to the next cocktail party. But Burke told Orridge, it's not going to be like that. There's a mm -hmm. lot of unhappy people. They're unhappy about Ron and Don. And you, it's a heads well, up, be prepared. Let's show exhibit number one, if we can, right here. This is an interview. This is in 2010, so even before mm -hmm. that yeah. meeting. It's game three of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Ron McLean is doing one of his intermission interviews with the commissioner, Gary Bettman. And it, it, it does get a wee testy, right? Let's uh, show us all that, shall we? Go ahead, Sheldon. In your State of the Union the other day, you said there are no owners giving back the keys. Correct. Notwithstanding, you did a great job with Florida when Alan Cohen may have thrown in his keys. No, 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 no. We switched general partners. He's still a partner in the club. He has equity? Yes. Oh, good. And with Orange I'm glad, Lewis? I'm glad we clarified and that. And I guess just because, you know, your partner, the players with all the escrow, they're worried about the franchise values and what they're getting and the money that they're well, spending. franchise values has nothing to do with the escrow. Well, it does in a sense because if you have a great franchise, uh, you're, you're right. I, uh, well, thank yeah, you. You're, you're dev dead right on that. But if the business keeps building revenues and if you go into markets that are healthy Ron, and big. Ron, Ron. Go ahead. We're, we're coming through a recession. How about Dallas, Tom Hicks? Have Tom you been funding the Dallas Stars? No. All right. But Tom's clearly turning back the keys, right? No, he's selling the club. He hasn't turned back the keys. All right. Hockey has been terrific. That's These fair. playoffs are great. We're watching <clears throat> a, a wonderful game, and you just want to tick off franchise after franchise? No. What, what inside of you compels you to want to go in that direction? Because I don't believe Gary, our viewers are really that interested in the franchise the players, status. I'm doing it for the players. How's that? I think the players might wonder why you don't go into Southern Ontario, because it could be so profitable. That's, again, just sort of a player's take on that. One other thing about Winnipeg. When who, who, are you, who are you getting your information from as to what the players are thinking. They don't have an Can't executive. Can't from their union head, that's right. right. So, so who are you? You're, well, you're, go, you you're making know? this up? No, no, yes. I go to Forbes. I go to the Sports Business Journal, Rick Burton, and, 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 and that tells, And that no, tells you what the players are thinking? Rod, wish we had more time. I know that's uh, I, confrontational, but it's it's just good to, to hear you on those subjects. I, this wasn't confrontational. Good. <laughs> oh, 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 yes, it was. <laughs> yeah. um, what was uh, the commissioner's reaction to that interview? Well, shortly after that, he made it known to the CBC that I will never go on Hockey Night in Canada again as long as Ron McLean's there. Mm. And uh, Brian Burke, by the way, had done the same thing himself. I forget it was around the same time. But, uh, yeah, Ron, God love him, uh, felt very strongly that there, the players didn't really have a voice at, you know, at on network television and that, uh, it, you know, it behooved him to do that. And that's why he was always badgering Gary Bettman. And, Ron, uh, Ron made no bones about the fact that he was, quote unquote, representing the player's point of view during this interview. Yeah, now, yeah and that's, it, uh, that, that was his thing. He just thought that, that, that it was always pro-management in, in t TV discussions. Do you think that's problematic for a journalist to be representing? Well, yeah, if, I guess if you say it just like that, Maybe it is, but at the same time, his his where he was coming from was that we needed equal time for both sides, and so this is you know I am bringing something up that no one else would. So in that regard, yeah, I think he was you know I think his intentions were honorable. But what happened was this fed into the whole thing about the uh, management across the league being very unhappy with the CBC, and they uh, you know because they thought that they were too biased in favor of the players. Um, and so they were going to confront uh, Jeffrey Orridge and Kirsten Stewart about this. And the other person they were really unhappy with, too, was Don Cherry. And this may have been more Brian Burke that he, because Cherry at that time was constantly attacking Burke and the Leafs for not having enough Ontario-born yes. players in the lineup. Yes. And this was a sore spot with both of them. So Orridge and Stewart go to this meeting, and sure enough, they get leveled. Burke is the guy who got up and laid into them. The guy who issued the warning was the one. And then the interesting thing that happened was after he sat down, one of the Vancouver Canucks governors got up. Most people think it was Mike Gillis. People tend not to remember now. And he said, I agree with everything Brian Burke said. Well, this was lost on Orridge and Stewart because they weren't really hockey people. But to hockey people, that was really significant because the Canucks and Brian Burke hated each other. <laughs> the Canucks had <laughs> oh, fired okay. Burke a few years before. Right. And then uh, Dave Nonis took over. He was Burke's assistant. And then he got fired and was replaced by Mike Gillis. So there was a huge enmity hmm. between the Canucks. Okay, but having said all that, once once Rogers and Bell, because they both came in with with north of five billion dollar yeah. offers, yeah. once they're putting that kind of money on the table, 
safe to assume that the CBC just couldn't play in that fish? No, they had no chance, and they should have known that going in. This is what still astonishes me, even, you know, five, six years later, is that, you know, you think, didn't these guys do their homework? They seem to have the attitude that, um, well, we've been partners for this with this NHL for 60 years, so that should buy us something. They should, and they came in with this the same sort of offer that they had in the past. If there's a Canadian team playing on Saturday night, in, then it's going to be on the CBC, and we're going to have the same sort of package. And they had been told heading into this, no, it's different now. Mm. There's big money. And what they should have done right from the start was form a partnership with one of those two entities, Rogers or Bell, and they steadfastly refused. And in the end, they got shut out completely. And it didn't have to happen if they'd just done their homework. Well, you know? they, they, it was actually a little bit, I mean, as I understand it from reading it in your book, they got more than shut out. They basically got told when Rogers won, we're going to give you some games. Yeah, oh and, yeah. And, and you're going to cover them, and you're going to get no ad revenue from them, and you're going to use your people to do work for us yeah. so that we can make money. And, and not to mention, give us office space in your own building. In your yeah, building. studio space, yeah. How it, humiliating was that for CBC? It, it was enormously. And, and, you know, to this day, there's huge anger among some CBC staffers that this happened. Mm -hmm. Because, as I had said a few minutes ago, it, it didn't have to happen. If, they, if they'd have just, you know used a little sense and, and realized what they were up against and, and decided, okay, let's make the best deal we can. Because they compounded it, actually. Once they lost the contract, then they turned around and got taken advantage of in a really one-sided deal, the one you just referred to. And, and that just increased the anger of the staff because they said, how could you then just turn around and hand over our airwaves for free? You didn't have to. It's not like Rogers had their own network ready to go. And in the end, it was, it was a huge bluff by Keith Pelley, who was head of Rogers Media at the time, to get that deal. Hmm. And, and the CBC guys fell for it. Because, in fact, CBC's got, obviously... Tentacles oh, yeah. all they, over the country. They had they the biggest over-the-air television yeah. network in the country. Um, if Bell had won the contract, they had CTV, okay, which can rival the mm -hmm. CBC in reach. But Rogers had nothing comparable to that. And, mm -hmm. and I think Pelly would admitted it to people I talked to later. He said, we didn't have even CTV. We had um, City at the time, which was in some of the major cities, but I don't think there was any presence on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, Pelly had said, my only, if, if the CBC had told me to shove it, my only choice, I would have had to go to Global. And, and, and again, Global doesn't have the reach CBC right. does. But instead, the CBC executive said, oh, okay, yeah, you know. Now, Gary Bettman, the commissioner, ultimately made the decision on who to partner with. Yeah, it was very Rogers. much his decision in the end, yeah. And, and interestingly enough, he did not get, I mean, he almost always insists on a unanimous vote for his decisions. There was one team that didn't vote. Oh, yeah, the Leafs abstained, and uh, that will... To me, I, and some some media types made a big deal out of it. How this was, uh, you know, indication of turmoil in in the Maple Leafs boardroom, and I didn't think so. I, I, it made sense to me that they abstained simply because the fact that their majority owners were the two parties that were fighting over the contract in the first place. So. Um, it, it made sense to me that they abstained. However, I think there were some questions about um, just where people like Larry Tannenbaum, who was chairman of MLSE and the 25% owner, where his loyalties lay in that whole deal. Was it with Bell or with Rogers? You know, uh, well, that's a tough one for him. And, and in fact, I presume for the league as well, given that both Bell and Rogers made $5 billion plus multi-year offers why did the league ultimately decide to go with Rogers over Bell? Well, because the Rogers guys were smart enough to tell the league exactly what they wanted to hear. Hmm. You know, the money in the end wasn't the big game changer. It was how the broadcasts were going to go. A pet peeve of Gary, which you heard on that clip you just played, is that not enough attention was paid to the players, like, and, and too much was on the panel shows, the, uh, you know, Ron and Don and all that stuff. He wanted more features on the players. So when they're making the pitch to Gary Bettman, John Collins, who was the head of marketing at the time for the NHL, and Bill Daly, the uh, deputy commissioner, they really emphasized that we're going to tell the players' stories. We're going to make this about the players. And they said, you know, things like, your logo is going to be on all of our company trucks, which it ended up being, things like that. And that ultimately, in the end, uh, 
you know, swayed it toward towards Rogers, along with a couple of other key decisions made that uh, the most important being that Nadir Mohammed, who at that time was the CEO of Rogers Communications, he was very much a part of the negotiations. And that is very important with Bettman. And again, this is where the CBC failed. And Bell, too, ultimately. They didn't understand their opponent. Gary has always had a really acute sense of his own importance and the importance of his league. So when he's negotiating a big deal, he wants to be sitting across the table from the most important guy or, or most important person, rather, at that company that he's negotiating. And Rogers got that. And Rogers made sure of that. In fact, that was Scott Moore because Scott Moore spent years as head of CBC Sports and head of, uh, they called it CBC Revenue. I think it was the advertising department. So he was an important guy there and he got to know Batman, and he insisted, when we're doing this, Nadir has to be front and center. And so that's, they came in, whereas George Cope, who was CEO of uh, Bell Canada, just said, no, he, you know, I'm not, he had a very contentious relationship with Batman anyway, through his role as a, a member of the board of directors of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. Mm. They'd already crossed swords a few times. So he stayed out of the negotiations, which Bettman didn't like. And Hubert Lacroix, who was head of the CBC at the time, he made the same decision. It was They had one initial meeting with Gary uh, Bettman and John Collins and Bill Daly, and he said, okay, you're in good hands. I'll turn it over to, well, Jeffrey Orridge and uh, Neil McEnany at the time. Mm. And this did not go over well with Bettman, it was noted. On the day when it was announced, there was an uncomfortable moment at the press conference. And I'm going to read an excerpt from your book as you describe it. As the press conference on November 26, 2013 was nearing the end, Rogers broadcaster Darren Millard made a mild joke about how there were struggling franchises in the U.S. Next to him on the stage, Commissioner Gary Bettman responded with, You now have to play nice, which drew a laugh from the audience. When Millard said that would take some getting used to, Bettman said, well, you'd better get used to it quick. It was not in an entirely humorous vein. Bettman knew the entire roster of Rogers broadcasters was in the room. A message was delivered. Since the audience was almost entirely made up of journalists, the next question was just how much leeway would Sportsnet people have to question the NHL, considering the enormous financial bond between Rogers and the NHL? Now, this is not unique. This happens, obviously, in every oh, sport time, yeah. with every rights holder. You know, the NFL gets billions of dollars from networks. Yeah. How can those networks be, uh, you know, presumed to be covering them with as much journalistic rigor as they might cover anything else? How has Rogers done at managing that apparent built-in conflict? Uh, I think they've done about what you would expect. You know, they don't... Uh, you don't see a lot of coverage of the concussion issue on Rogers. You do see some. I will give them that. It's, it'd be unfair for me to say no. But they don't hammer away at those kinds of issues the way, well, even the way you saw Ron McLean do so in his CBC days. Um, and the interesting swing to me in all of this is, is actually TSN. Because you could make the same accusations at TSN about, say, the CFL, because they own all this, mm -hmm. the TV rights to, uh, to CFL games. And they tend to, uh, you know, their coverage of CFL is, is sort of what you would expect, you know, a little soft maybe. But right around the time they lost the, uh, the rights to, uh, or shortly after they lost the rights to Rogers, uh, they started a sort of investigative division. They hired a reporter, and he started hammering away at the concussion mm -hmm. issue. And I suspect that, you know, if, if the hockey rights had remained in Bell's hands, I'm not sure we would have seen mm -hmm. coverage that was quite that hard-hitting on, on the whole concussion do, issue. Do you think Gary Bettman and the NHL see Rogers Sportsnet as essentially the public relations arm of the NHL because of the financial... Um, you know, links that both oh, sides yeah. now have. Uh, I think deep down, yes, they do. They never admit it out loud. Um, you know, but what that piece, the little excerpt you read there, that was vintage Gary Bettman. Mm -hmm. That was, you are our partner now. You're going to do it, uh, we say, or else. But he couched it in sort of a little humorous vein. But one thing you know if you've known Gary Bettman for any length of time is that you, just, you don't mess with that guy. You know? Now, David, having said all that, we remember George Strombolopoulos was brought in to be the sort of new, younger, hipper yeah. host of Hockey Night in Canada. And for whatever reason, viewers didn't take to him. And so they decided to bring Ron McLean back in. And somebody from Rogers asked Gary Bettman if he was okay with that. What came back? 
It was basically, well, I'm okay with if if they're okay with it. But you know, I I don't think he was he was too thrilled about it. But he realized that uh, the ratings had been cratering for two years, and viewers were unhappy. And and so at Gary Bettman is not a guy, I'll give him this much, he, aside from being one of the smartest people I've ever met, he never lets his personal issues get into the business side of things. So if it was good business, and, and Rogers told him it was, that was their argument, they did make a point of telling him this is what they planned. They didn't just do it without telling him. But he could have vetoed it, and, presumably, if he didn't. Yeah, I think he probably could yeah. have. But he realized, he said, you know, this is good for your business, so yeah, you, you've got my blessing. But he did that with the comfort of knowing that there's no way Ron McLean could be the same Ron McLean uh, badgering him as he was in the CBC days. And that was pretty clear in their very first interview, which came during the World Cup of Hockey uh, of the years. Is it Was it 2016, I think? Uh, Forget now. Yeah, so it was, but it was in that September tournament. And that was you know, a very closely watched interview, at least throughout the inter- industry, because it was the first mm-hmm. time they had sat down together since that clip you showed earlier. Mm-hmm. So tell and that me, went very well, by the way. Right, yes, there was not expect, quite the, yeah. the fractiousness in that interview. Just in our last minute and change here then, um, okay, so Rogers has got the games and the games are all over the place and they subbed out a bunch of games to, uh, you know, French language television and CBC got some games, TSN got some games. Yeah. Anyway, so it, it, I mean, it's $5.2 billion, but they didn't pay that much because they got, they got a lot of money back from, from other subcontractors as it were. What has the loss of the hockey rights done to the CBC, in your view? Well, it, it, well right off the top, it costs all kinds of jobs, although putting a, a number on it is, I, I say you could argue probably hundreds, but putting a, a number on it's a little difficult because of the different nature of the jobs. I mean, that was the loss, depending on your estimate, of about half of their English language advertising revenue. Mm. Now that's that's a stunning loss Just for any company. Tens of millions yeah, of dollars, it was right? uh, probably hundreds of millions hundreds in of the millions. end. Wow. Yeah, it was like, my best estimate was that they were getting somewhere around, I think 175 million a year, maybe a little less, uh, for advertising revenue, just for Hockey Night in Canada. Wow. Like that show drove the whole network. And, and again, you know, for their net, for their executives to go into this as ill prepared as they were, although I suppose they'll argue they weren't, is insane because you wiped out half your uh, your advertising revenue, and you did that while the government was cutting back its contribution, which is much larger. But at, at the same time, so you're getting whipsawed by this, and it was a devastating loss to the corporation. And uh, shows were canceled. Uh, people were laid off. It, it just reverberated right through the whole the whole mm-hmm. company. That story and more, all told in David Schultz's book, Hockey Fight in Canada: The Big Media Faceoff Over the NHL. David, thanks for coming in tonight. Good to oh, see you. Oh, you're welcome. Again. It was a pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.